In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. Everyone must appear before the righteous judge, Yeshua. And we, the bride, get to appear before the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. But for those Old Testament people and the people during the tribulation, they have to appear before a different judgment, the sheep and goats judgment. The people are dying and going to hell, eternal separation from the Father. We thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you've been with us through this whole series. It's been good news. It's been some not so good news today, I think, as we finish this out. Maybe some good news, yes? It, yeah. It's been intense. And yeah, today is that's a good word. <laughs> judgment, right? Oh, that's but, intense. But too. redemption too. Okay, thank you. That's yes. That's good. Yeah, news. there's a lot of good, but you know, with all the good, there has to be some bad too. Right. So at the very end, we all have to go before that judgment as you spoke of. That is part of the process. But after the judgment, you're gonna see it's so far worth the price. I find it interesting that we started our journey in Israel the first night of Sukkot, of the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're ending this story with tabernacling Yeshua. You know, he's finally ruling in tabernacling with man. It's deep. It's awesome. It is. Let's go there right now. The guys are in Israel on location. Man, Josh, I'm still so excited from last week's episode. I have no appetite. I can't eat. Yeah, 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 me too. I mean, it's like with Yeshua and Satan, and he just always wins, good always triumphs. It's, it's kind of like, you know, that Luke Skywalker and the Emperor. You can't top that. Is this going to be one of those things where you have to have a dance scene with all the short Wookiees in the forest? Ah, uh, Josh, Lynn. that's Ewoks. I'm actually kind of impressed that Josh's Star Wars reference, even though it was wrong, Still, dancing teddy bears look ridiculous. Wait, oh wait, it's Chap. He's... He has a video for us. Let's see what we gotta do today. Well guys, road map to Armageddon. It looks like we've made it to the destination. The question is, what happens next? I know you're gonna tell us. My wife tells me, Jeffrey, it's time to take out the trash. And that's exactly what we see. The Lord shows up in town, and it's time to displace the wicked forces. Barry says, take out the trash and let's clean up the house. And so it is. Tell us the story about how the Lord represents on planet Earth, takes out the trash, and then cleans house in the household of God. Oh, heard the man. Let's do it. Revelation 19, 20 through 21. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. No, Josh, there's a reason that the beast and the false prophet, these two Nephilim hybrids, are not killed by Yeshua, but cast alive into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. I mean, this is the ultimate punishment. Uh, a lesser punishment would be to die like the Nephilim of old. They were killed with the flood. That was the first death. That's not as cool as the second death. Uh, some of those disembodied spirits were bound in hell. But the key to why God doesn't want them to die is in Isaiah chapter 26, 14. It says, they are now dead. They live no more. The departed spirits, the Rephaim, do not rise. You punished them and brought them to ruin. You wiped out all memory of them. The Rephaim were Nephilim, yeah. but in the land of Canaan where they lived, they had very pale skin. In yeah. Hebrew, it literally meant the dead ones. Right. Now, these dead ones, they don't receive a resurrection like everybody does because they're actual hybrid creatures. So that means everybody else, all the sinners, everybody, they, that goes to the great white throne, yeah. but not these guys. And so Elohim wants them to be alive as long as possible so that they pay for their sins. But what happens to Satan? Well, we got to figure out. Let's read the scripture about what happens to the dragon. Let's do it. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Guys, we're here on the eastern slope, 
of the Temple Mount. You know, we're heading to the Eastern Gate this way and directly across the Mount of Olives to my left. Now in scripture, we know that Yeshua ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. Acts 1.11, these two angels come and say, hey guys, he's gonna come back the same way that he came with his feet stepping on the Mount of Olives. Well, Zechariah 14, verse four and eight says, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. The entire terrain of Israel is gonna change, uh, flattening the whole earth, but this mountain is gonna be raised up as is described in Zechariah 14, 10 through 11. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and the people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. That sevenfold earthquake <laughs> will flatten every mountain on the earth, but Jerusalem will be raised up. That temple mount will become Mount Eden again, the Mount of Congregation. Isaiah 2, 2 says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It'll be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Just as that river flowed down from Elion's throne, down Mount Eden and split at the base of the garden, the living waters will return again. Zechariah 14, 8 says, in that day, it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the Eastern sea and half of them towards the Western sea. Joel 3.18 says, A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water from the valley of the Acacias. And Ezekiel 47 describes the river again. It, it, when, the, when the mountains split, it comes out and fills the valley. It comes from the throne of God. And it gives life to everything it touches. Trees of life return again, just like in the Garden of Eden. They grow on the banks, giving life to everything it touches. And I think we need to go visit that Eastern Gate right now and see a close-up of what's about to happen in the future. I kind of want to see the bells, but yeah, we'll do the gate. The gate's fine, yeah. Please tell me I'm not so old that I'm the only one that hears the bells. I can't be that guy. Good bells, man. Yeah. yeah. Now there's definitely bells in here. Now look at that. The Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate, the Shushan Gate, the Gate of Mercy, so many names, Josh. But we know in Ezekiel 43, 4, that Yeshua, after stepping foot on the Mount of Olives, is going to head to this gate. And, and that, that Ezekiel passage describes the glory of God finally returning through the Eastern Gates, talking about Yeshua. And he's on his way to the Temple Mount, to that temple, the Abomination Temple, the third temple. He's going to cleanse it out. It's polluted. He's going to destroy it and build his fourth temple. I know what you're thinking. You've been thinking it for all 10 episodes. When is somebody going to tell him that we can see he's sweating? We already knew. We also knew that my hair does this in literally every scene. That's right, it's windy outside and I have curly hair. No, we do not have people to follow us around and dab us. I even tried multiple shirts. It didn't work. I sweat through everything. I'm in a 60 degree room and I'm sweating right now. I'm just not showing you. You didn't discover anything. We already had it figured out, but we still love you. I'm so sorry. Now, I know you're thinking not everybody would believe this stuff in history, but there's some people who are afraid of it. In 1541 AD, an Ottoman Sultan named Solomon the Magnificent was concerned, what if this Messiah actually does this? Yeah. He has a brilliant idea. Mm. I'm going to prevent him by sealing up the Eastern Gate. Mm. Now you think that's a, that's doesn't make any sense. Who would ever think that way? Well, the Pharisees had a, a similar line of thought. They said, yeah. well, if we seal up the tomb of Yeshua and put guards outside of it, he won't be able to come back to life again. Genius! Yeah, that's right. Put a rock, a seal. That's going to stop the Son of God. Not happening. But the important part of Scripture we see throughout prophecy, the thing that all the Jews are waiting for, is that moment where God says the whole house of Israel is going to be saved. They're going to be restored to their land. And Romans 11, 25 through 26 describes this. Romans 11, 25 and 26. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, 
and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The fullness of the Gentiles is coming to completion with the conclusion of the rapture. Mm. And at the end of the tribulation, all of the house of Israel who have survived will make it into Messiah's kingdom. Mm. Now, those of the house of Israel who died during the age of the law, they don't all get a free pass. Mm. If you lived wickedly, if you died in sin, there was not that provision for you at that time. That's true, guys. Remember, during the age of the law, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, if you were wicked, you were sent to hell. Now, those who are righteous, who are justified by faith, they went to Abraham's bosom. Now, when Yeshua died, he went to Abraham's bosom. And Ephesians 4, 8 through 10 says that he preached to those saints who were captive. He led captivity captive. Upon his resurrection, he took them to heaven to be with his father. But Josh, there's still a matter of judgment. Guys, talking about Armageddon is like my favorite subject, but a hot number two, judgment. Who can't like it? You're such a weirdo. Who likes judgment? It's cool. Bad guys get what they have coming to them, you know? I mean... <sighs> Ridiculous. Everyone must appear before the righteous judge, Yeshua. And we, the bride, get to appear before the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. But for those Old Testament people and the people during the tribulation, they have to appear before a different judgment, the sheep and goats judgment. And believe it or not, it occurs right over there. Really? Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you might not have known that Caleb and I have a background in musical theater. That's right, we've been in musicals literally since high school, which might explain why we present everything like this. Lebanon. Nazareth. Syria is right there, guys. And this one place is Magdala. It was this mountain behind us. The Fortress of Nimrod. This is a platform well, we finally found it, Fort Vat Omrit. Directly across from us is Har Habayit. The Jewish people worship at the Western Wall. And then this is a conclusion to see the light that is at the end of the tunnel. The desert behind me, this may be the path that the Jews take. So he gathers his armies, and they camp out right here in the Valley of Jezreel. That's right, this is fun stuff. Joel 3, 1 through 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Guys, we're here at the Kidron Valley, and I need to clear up an elephant in the room. I need to know how every person that survives and all the spirits of the dead are supposed to fit in that tiny valley right there. You got a point, Josh. Don't make any sense to me, Joel. Small. Joel 314 says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. I mean, it's not literally possible, right? I know we've talked about in the past how there's going to be a topographical change here in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I know that most Bible scholars believe that the Kidron is the valley of Jehoshaphat. But there's really no biblical evidence to back that up. Yeah. We do know, however, that when Yeshua comes down, he's going to touch his foot down on the Mount of Olives, split it in two, and a new giant valley is going to be formed. Uh, that makes sense. That's the one of Jehoshaphat. Yes. Joel 312. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Now, many claim that this judgment of the sheep of goats is for the Goy only, the Gentiles. But why would Yeshua over and over again speak about the sheep and goats in his parables? He said he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I believe he was preaching this message over and over again to try to make those lost sheep to become found sheep. He was giving them the key, the access to know how to enter his father's kingdom. They have to go before that judgment as well, just as anybody else. Everybody has to appear before the judgment. Daniel 12, one through three says, and at that time, your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Remember, throughout time, there is only one way to salvation. That is through Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Daniel says that many bodies will awake and be resurrected. However, many will not. Mm. And that everlasting contempt is the outer darkness that the spirits will be sent to. Matthew 25, 30 says, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're absolutely right, Josh. You know, everyone goes before the judgment. The dead go and they're judged before they are resurrected. So after the sheep 
are judged correctly. They go into Yeshua's kingdom. Then they receive their resurrected bodies. But the goats don't receive their resurrection. They go to hellfire into outer darkness. Matthew 25, 31 through 33. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Verse 46. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just like Daniel said, the righteous receive eternal life, but the wicked everlasting hellfire. It's not a good story, guys. You see in Matthew 25, 34 through 44, it explains that at the sheep and goats judgment, people will be judged according to how they treated Yeshua. What do you mean how you treat Yeshua? How you treated Yeshua's people, the Jewish people. Now we know anti-Semitism is a big and heavy topic. It's always been from the dawn of time. So anybody who doesn't have the love of Yeshua in their hearts, I believe automatically inclines toward anti-Semitism. So it's gonna be a wallop of a judgment for Gentiles, as well as there's a judgment for Jews before that. Guys, all those who are martyred have already been judged and found worthy. Hmm. They will be in Yeshua's kingdom. Revelation 20, 4 through 6 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Guys, it's amazing. Those who die for Yeshua during the tribulation wash their filthy robes in the blood of the Lamb and are made right standing with God. And after the sheep and goats judgment, they are resurrected, given glorified bodies. They enter into Yeshua's kingdom during the millennium and rule and reign with him. This is called the first resurrection. However, the wicked are not resurrected until the end of the millennium at the great white throne of judgment. Revelation 20, 5 through 6 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It's interesting that we being the bride of Messiah, who are raptured before the tribulation, we get our new bodies, our resurrected bodies early. So even if we never die, we get to join in with Yeshua being the first of the resurrected of the dead. And another special thing we receive is we don't live on the earth during the millennium. We actually live in the new Jerusalem. I know this is kind of foreign to your thinking, but in Revelation 21, 2, it, it talks about the new Jerusalem is actually the bride. And the angel says, John, come look over here. You see that? The new Jerusalem? He points, he says, that's the wife of the lamb. We have that special position. Yeshua went to prepare a place for us. He was building that great city for us, that place where we're gonna live and reign with him. It doesn't mean we can't go to the earth, you know, and meet people and, and be there from time to time, but we are supposed to rule from heavenly places with him. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. It seems in this modern age, our focus is on what we can get to be more comfortable. Our whole idea is to live our life so that we can retire in that comfort. But we were placed here with a purpose that was predestined before the foundations of this earth. And now is the time to fight the good fight of faith. This series isn't about shock and awe. It wasn't about entertainment value because of the beautiful shots or locations. It was about awakening us from that slumber to realize that people are dying and going to hell, eternal separation from the Father. If you do not do your job to stand up and to fight and show the love of Yeshua. Stand against the forces of the enemy and having done all to stand again. Now is our time in history. Now is the time that the people of Yeshua HaMashiach stand together and defend the true Messiah. Amen. Revelation 22, 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you those things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.
when you used to see uh, films in the theater and the actual film was over, it'd go thup, 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 thup. You could hear that it was over, right? Yeah. So what happens in the end? The millennial reign. Everything's happened in the story. We just finished it. So do we really just sit on puffy clouds playing harps and enjoying God's presence by doing absolutely nothing for eternity? I don't think so. And so we discussed with an expert, Dr. Andy Woods, what is life going to be like for believers during the millennium? You're going to enjoy what he has to say. Well, I think the simplest way to explain the millennium is to go to a passage most people don't go to right away for whatever reason mm -hmm. to defend the doctrine. Most people go right to Revelation 20, but which is a very important text, but I'm going to go to Genesis 1 as a foundation. And, you know, it's in Genesis chapter 1 that you have God ruling over the first Adam who has a wife along with his wife. The two of them are governing you know, creation for God. And that's where you see, and I'm thinking of around verses 26 through 28, all that dominion language, you mm -hmm. know, subdue, rule. So really the goal of history is how that structure in Genesis 1 is brought back. Mm -hmm. And and when it's all said and done, um, you're going to have that same structure reemerge where God the Father is going to be ruling over, this time the last Adam, Mm -hmm. uh, Yeshua, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he along with his wife, the bride, the bride of Christ, yes. right? The church, that's us, are going to be governing creation uh, on his behalf. So God cannot allow the earth to go out of existence mm. until he reclaims authority. And so that's sort of the goal of history. It's, it's the goal of scripture. It's where everything's moving towards. And obviously there's a lot of details in between, yeah, yeah. but that's kind of the big picture. We've got good news. There's an old song that says, good news, good news, good news, <laughs> good news. Let's all tell the world about it. That's an old song that we've sung, but we're here. Yeshua mm -hmm. is coming to set up his kingdom. That's right. Abomination, desolation, it's all that is gone, and we have good news. Because right. Yeshua is a good God, and he wants us to know the end from the beginning, so we know the end plan, the end game of all things. He set into motion and we are his children. He wants us to be a part of that. We really can't survive without hope. Yes. I mean, I think we're created that way that we need to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. and it's, it's coming through all the horrid end times. Yeah. It's going to end well. That's right. Daniel 7, 13 through 14 says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. That, that just excites me, guys. That's the Old Testament. He's talking about the ancient of days and Yeshua, the Son of Man, in the same passage. And we get to rule and reign with Him as it continues in uh, verse 27. Verse 27 says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Hmm. Now what's so interesting about this verse and about Jesus is the fact that sin does nothing but take from you. Sin offers every pleasure in the world, but in the end, sin robs you of everything you have and everything that the Father sent His Son to die for you to have. We all the time say, I don't know why I was born. What's my identity? What's this? And we seek after it and all of these things that bring us this temporary pleasure to this flesh. But yet the verse says right here in Daniel that when Yeshua comes and He's earned His kingdom, He freely shares it with all of His children. All those who have said, I choose to serve you. Today is the day that you get to decide whether or not you're going to continue to serve your flesh, be ravaged by sin, and then abandoned for eternity, or whether or not you're going to bow your knee and humbly submit to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, because He's waiting for you today and He loves you with all of His heart. He does. He loves the world. Jesus loves the world. Mm -hmm. Every color, every nation, and that is one of the reasons that we are here on the airwaves. We literally go throughout the world spreading the good news of the gospel. And we want all of you to be part of it. So join with us in spreading that news. This story, this program, 
literally across the world because of you, so thank you. We'll be right back. Our resource this week, the book, What Should We Think About Israel? How do you separate fact from fiction in the Middle East conflict? Theologian, archeologist, and research author, Randall Price provides objective facts about Israel's past, present, and future. Look past the heated debates and discern for yourself what is important to know about Israel and how that affects you today. Contact us and ask for the book, What Should We Think About Israel? Well, we are at the end of this series. We hope you've enjoyed it. There's a lot of content that we've brought you. If you'd like to review some of that, you can go online and see all of these programs again. We leave you now with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt. The title is A Thousand Years, but before we do that, guys. Guys, I want to remind you, Yeshua said in Revelation 22, 12, Hineni bah maher, behold, I am coming quickly. And remember, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The king will come to dwell. Yerushalayim, I will come at last. And when a thousand years have finally passed, I will see the new Jerusalem descending. I will be there for the grand and glorious ending. Out of heaven I will see a city come, and I will live forever in Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem, you'll see Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Our Jewish Roots is a presentation of Zola Levitt Ministries. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.